Um, not all morally right actions deserve moral praise. So, for example, we're reluctant to praise the person who raises money for charity by running a marathon, say, if she excessively posts her achievements all over social media. Now, raising money for charity is morally right, but given the frequency with which she advertises her efforts publicly, we begin to get suspicious about the content of her motive. Perhaps in running the race, her primary ambition wasn't to raise money for charity, but instead it was to solicit admiration and attention from her friends. But in any case, morally worthy actions don't just depend upon whether it was the right thing to do, it also depends upon whether it was motivated in the right way. And an account of moral worth aims to identify what these good motives ought to consist in. And in the talk today, I'm interested in one particular answer to that question. And on this answer says that uh, morally worthy actions are right actions which are performed in response to the relevant moral reasons. That is the reasons making the action right. And I've called this the right reason thesis. And the central idea behind the doctrine is that moral worth isn't about doing something right because it is right. Rather, it's about doing something right for the reasons which make it right. And my talk has two uh, ambitions today. So the first ambition is to show you that the right reason thesis isn't as successful as contemporary discussions would appear to suggest. And that's because the view fails to satisfy adequately two important desiderata associated with theories of moral worth. So the first one I call degrees, just says, a theory of moral worth ought not merely stipulate if an action is praiseworthy or blameworthy, but also the extent to which it deserves praise or blame. And then the second I've called overdetermination. So as a theory of moral worth ought to tell us if right actions produced from overdetermined motives have moral worth. So the idea is, you know, right reason thesis doesn't do a good job at capturing these two requirements. And then the second ambition of the talk is to say, well, actually the right reason thesis can capture these two requirements if the thesis is supplemented with a counterfactual framework. And supplementing RRT with a counterfactual framework entails that when assessing an action's moral worth, we not only consider if the agent responded to the right sorts of reasons in the actual world, but also if they're motivated by these reasons in um, other possible worlds, right? Nearby possible worlds in particular, right? The more worlds they do well in, um, the stronger they are motivated by these right sorts of reasons. And the idea is that in virtue of attending to the agent's motivational strength is the account able to satisfy the two requirements above. So let's call uh, RRT post counterfactual framework the hybrid view. Uh, that's a terrible name. This kind of a placeholder for now. That's what we're going with. Um, um, to clarify, my aim today isn't really to defend the right reason thesis. Rather, my aim is to say, look, if you're already a fan of the right reason thesis, you actually have strong reasons to adopt my hybrid account instead. Not only does an appeal to counterfactuals provide um, a successful theory of moral worth by satisfying these two requirements, it does so in a way that's um, intuitive and, and uniquely unified as well. So the plan for today, I'm gonna to introduce the right reason thesis a bit more then the hybrid view. And then I'll turn my attention to the two desiderata. Um, firstly, at degrees, then over determination. And I'll just tell you in these sections why the hybrid view doesn't do a good job at meeting them and how the hybrid view does do a good job. Okay, so a couple of clarifications about um, the type of project that I'm undertaking here. So moral worth can be defined as a particular way in which an action is valuable. And as mentioned, it's thought that this value is largely derived from an agent's motive for acting. So moral worth shouldn't be identified solely with the action's moral desirability, right? Whether it's right or whether it's wrong or how wrong it is or how right it is. But with that said, moral worth will likely depend upon the moral desirability of an action, right? Wrong actions will be candidates for blame, right actions, candidates for blame, uh, praise. And I don't wanna commit myself to any first order theory in the talk, so I'm just gonna say morally right for things we think are desirable, morally wrong, for things we think are morally undesirable. And this includes supererogatory actions, required, forbidden, permissible, impermissible, suborogatory, whatever, a big broad range. And then the second important clarification is that I'm offering an account of praise and blame worthiness. And considerations of praise and blame worthiness can be independent of whether we have grounds to treat an agent in a certain way 
given that they are praise or blameworthy, such as whether we should adjust our attitudes towards them, whether their action makes them a candidate for punishment, um, or even whether it's appropriate to voice our moral criticisms. So pra praise and blame worthiness is what we're after. Okay, so let me introduce the right reason thesis then. So the most well-known variations of the right reason thesis have come from uh, Nomi Arpley and Julia Markovitz. And this is what Arpley says. For an agent to be morally praiseworthy for doing the right thing is for her to have done the right thing for the relevant moral reasons. That is the reasons for which she acts are identical to the reasons for which the action is right. Uh, similarly, Markovitz says, uh, my action is morally worthy if and only if my motivating reasons for acting coincide with the reasons morally justifying the act. That is, if and only if I perform the action I morally ought to perform for the normative reasons why it ought to be performed. Now, RRT's unique selling point here is this emphasis on right-making features as opposed to an action's rightness per se. So following Kant, um, accounts of moral worth have found value in an agent's being motivated because it is right. But for Arpley and Markowitz, this like de dicto desire to do the right thing is irrelevant when it comes to moral worth, right? A person doesn't have to um, believe or know that they are acting rightly in order to get moral credit. All that's required is that you do in fact act for the right making features. So uh, to illustrate, you know, suppose I help you move house and the reason that helping you move house is right is because it relieves some of your stress or something like that. Now, the reason that it relieves your stress must be the motive for which I act. That's the right making feature. And this is quite different from being motivated by the fact that it would be right to relieve your stress or it would be right to help you move house. Because in these scenarios, I'm motivated by a de dicto concern to do the right thing. And this, I don't get moral credit according to RRT. Um, Okay, yeah, to clarify a bit further, let's go back to the marathon case. So let's just suppose that our runner, in fact, is motivated by admiration and attention from her friends. Well, RRT says she rightly doesn't get any moral credit. You know, in this case, she'd have to run the marathon and raise money for charity for the reasons that make doing so right, presumably um, because it relieves suffering of those less fortunate or it increases welfare, something like that. Okay. So under RRT, praise, do the right thing for the right reasons. And something similar is true of uh, blameworthy actions. So when an agent does wrong and does so through insufficiently responding to the right sorts of reasons, the action warrants blame. And insufficiency can manifest itself either by a failure to respond to the right sorts of reasons or by a response to what um, no me Arpley calls sinister reasons. And these are reasons which are in conflict with morality. Um, so suppose uh, Martha doesn't call her mum up to wish her a happy birthday, right? And this makes Martha's mum uh, really sad. She's looking wistfully out the window and she's really sad. Now, there are many ways we can imagine Martha's motivational profile here. It could be the case that this is a calculated omission because she actually wants to hurt her mother's feelings. She doesn't like those close to her. Or it could be the case that after a long stressful day, Martha just forgets to call her mom, right? Now in the first scenario, she's blameworthy because she responds to sinister reasons. And in the second scenario, she's blameworthy because she fails to respond to the right sorts of reasons. Um, reasons like not calling my mom will make her upset, something like that. So blameworthy in both cases, even though only in one case, she's intentionally vicious. Now, the right reason thesis has attracted many contemporary sponsors, and I suspect a large part of the account's appeal is its ability to accommodate for this highly intuitive constraint on moral worth, which says that um, morally worthy actions are non-accidentally right. And I call this the non-accidentality constraint after uh, Jessica Israel. So this is just to say that moral praise requires that the action cannot be brought about through luck. Right? It can't be right by accident. Um, and we've kind of already seen evidence of this constraint with our marathon runner. So our runner doesn't deserve praise for raising money if she's motivated by the need for attention, because then she does something right by accident. There's a gap between why our agent performs the action and why she ought to perform the action. 
And this gap means that it's quite lucky that she ends up doing something right. Now, the right reason thesis like effectively closes this gap by demanding a tight connection between motives and rightness, motives and morality. Um, so right reason thesis does a really good job at capturing this constraint and the constraint cannot be understated. It's extremely important. We might think of it as like the foundational desideratum for a theory of moral worth, um, perhaps in the same way that epistemologists think that luckily true beliefs are not able to confer knowledge, right? We want to preclude those, so this is important. Another reason for its success, I think, is that um, moral knowledge is not required for moral praise on this account. So it doesn't matter if I know what the right reasons are, it doesn't matter if I believe that I'm acting for these reasons, all that matters is that I do in fact act for these reasons. And there's people like Huckleberry Finn who do something right in response to the right reasons, but who believe that they are acting wrongly get moral credit according to the view. Um, I won't go into the case, but suffice to say that, you know, people think that RRT gives you the right verdict on the Huckleberry Finn case, and it's a, a good virtue of the view. And then the last thing to say is it does a pretty good job at tracking our intuitions. Um, and not only that, it does a pretty good job at explaining our intuitions as well in these types of cases. Despite um, all these virtues though, I'm gonna tell you that actually RRT isn't as good as it, as it ought to be um, because it doesn't satisfy certain requirements. Now, before getting on to that, I just wanna briefly introduce the hybrid view, but um, it'll just be a brief introduction because as we go along, it'll become clear what a fully fledged account is gonna look like. So for now, I'll just say that the hybrid view maintains the right reason thesis. So it's still true that praise requires doing well in response to the right reasons. Blame requires doing badly through insufficiently responding to these reasons. But the hybrid view also demands that the agent is responsive or non-responsive to these reasons, not just in the actual world, but also in a range of nearby possible worlds, right? So we can think of moral worth under the hybrid view as like a threshold concept. So you have to meet a threshold before your action can be a candidate for praise or blame simpliciter by doing well in um, a range of nearby possible worlds. Okay, so that introduction's out of the way. Let's go to think about degrees. So sometimes two seemingly identical morally right actions might possess different amounts of moral worth and similarly two seemingly identical morally wrong actions might possess different amounts of negative moral worth. So we might say that Jane is more to blame for her rude outburst than John is for his equally rude outburst on the grounds that John has recently suffered a bereavement and he's under emotional strain. Now, as it stands, the right reason thesis does not discriminate between these two actions because it treats all praiseworthy actions as having equal amounts of moral worth and all blameworthy actions as having equal negative amounts of moral worth. But of course, you know, a, a comprehensive theory will go further and it'll tell us the extent to which an action has moral worth. I think degrees I've made up as a desideratum, but I think it's fairly uncontroversial. Um, so in her paper, Saints, Heroes, Sages and Villains, Julia Markovitz, one of the prominent defenders, says that she, quote, was pretty pleased, quote, with her account of the right reason thesis until she realized that it stopped short of meeting degrees. And it's in this paper that she seeks to remedy the oversight. So that's what I'm gonna focus on in this section. Um, I'm gonna give you Markovitz's proposal for identifying degrees. Um, I'll tell you two reasons why I don't think it's, it's, not, it's not great, because I don't think it captures the full spectrum. And also I don't know whether it really captures praise and blame worthiness or whether it's capturing, capturing our standing to praise and blame. And then after I've told you, given you some reasons to think that Markovitz's extension isn't very good, I'll move to tell you how the hybrid view accounts for degrees. Um, also, as a side note, um, Nomi Arpley also gives us conditions for capturing degree, uh, degrees of moral worth, but for brevity, I'm just gonna focus on Markovitz today, but I'm more than happy to talk about that in the Q&A. Okay. So here's how Markovitz um, captures degrees of moral worth. So she combines RRT with an appraiser appra relative approach. So she says that a heroic action, uh, by which she means a, a maximally praiseworthy action, 
A heroic action is a right action of some moral significance that most of us judging the action would not have the moral strength to perform had we been in the hero's place. And the same is true of distinctively blameworthy actions. She says, our condemnation of wrong actions tracks not just the strength of the wrong-making reasons or whether the agent acted for those wrong-making reasons, but also whether the agent acted wrongly in circumstances where most of us doing the judging would have acted rightly. Extraordinary sins draw more condemnation than ordinary ones, independent of the moral cost of the sin. That's a great quote. So, you know, maximal praise, maximal blame uh, is one whereby the agent responds to right-making reasons or doesn't respond to them and does so in circumstances where most of us doing the judging would not have done so had we been in the agent's shoes. Um, so notice that we still maintain RRT. So it's still true in order to get moral worth simpliciter, we have to fail to respond or to respond to the morally relevant reasons. And then to work out degrees, we just ask whether we would have done that had we been in the agent's shoes. And under this proposal, the extent to which an action has moral worth then is relative, right? It's relative to apprisers and a community of apprisers. The more unusual it would be for the action to occur in one's moral community, the more admiration or the more derision the action deserves. Now, of course, there can be disagreements amongst the community and amongst the prizes. So, you know, I might judge Feynman Sam to be a hero because I wouldn't have risked my life had I been in Feynman Sam's shoes, right? But his colleagues might reject the label. They might say, no, Feynman Sam's not a hero. He's just doing his job. And Markowitz thinks that when this apprisal disagreement happens, that we might both be right. She thinks that's probably an accurate description. Feynman Sam is a hero and is not a hero. And she thinks this is true because it kind of reflects our linguistic practices. Um, for example, sometimes you'll see on TV, someone has like apprehended a criminal in the street and they do an interview to camera and they say, well, I'm no hero, I'm doing what everyone else would have done. And we're at home thinking that there is no way I would have done that, right? So it kind of reflects our linguistic practices here. But this will be important um, later. Now, I think the extension is interesting, um, has a lot of virtues, but I worry that it doesn't really fully satisfy the desideratum. So it gives us the resources to, to capture maximally blameworthy actions and maximally praiseworthy actions, right? Heroism. These are actions that most of us would not have performed. But what of behavior that falls short of um, heroism and maximal blame, right? For there are actions which sit in between these two extremes that remain uncodified under the view. Now, a friend of the account might try to extend the view a bit further to capture these more ordinary in-between actions. For instance, you know, one could say, well, if a heroic action is one that most people would not perform, perhaps a considerably praiseworthy action, which just falls short of heroism, is one that nearly most people would not perform if they were judging the action. So, you know, say 90% of us would be unwilling to replicate the behavior of the agent, that's heroic. If by contrast, only 70% of us judge ourselves unwilling to replicate the behavior, well then the action isn't heroic, but it's certainly morally admirable. And then more formally, the idea is, you know, the, the degree to which an action is praiseworthy is proportionate to the amount of people who would judge themselves unable to perform the action had they been in the agent's shoes. And we can do the same for blameworthiness here. So we're, we're aggregating moral appraisals in order to find a kind of mean, and then the mean corresponds to degrees, and thus we satisfy properly the desideratum. Now the problem is that I don't think a, a friend of the account can make this type of move, because it's not obvious to me that we can aggregate moral appraisals on an appraiser relative approach. So recall that if two speakers disagree about whether an action is heroic or not, then the action itself is appropriately described as being heroic and not heroic. Feynman Sam is a hero and not a hero. We can't smudge together moral appraisals to generate a new one, which is almost heroic. Right? Now, if this is true, then that's a strange implication of the view because we get maximal praise and maximal blame, but there's a large swathe of more commonplace behavior that is going unaccounted for under the view. 
that's one worry. I mean, my second worry and perhaps deeper concern really about this kind of approach is that I don't know if it captures praise and blame worthiness. I think instead it's capturing something else like our standing to praise and blame. So on Markowitz's view, an action is more or less praiseworthy or blameworthy, right, relative to apprisers. And this means that degrees of moral worth depends upon how apprisers stand in relation to the action, right? Namely, it depends upon how I would judge had I been in your shoes. It depends upon a standing relation. But moral worth is typically understood to be a feature of an action which goes above and beyond standing relations. So to, to illustrate, right, uh, Mussolini might have admired Stalin's acts in the war, right? Indeed, Mussolini might have judged himself able to perform the same actions had he been in Stalin's shoes. But Stalin's actions are not made less blameworthy just because Mussolini stands in a certain relation to them, right? Now we might think it would be inappropriate for Mussolini to blame Stalin, given that he would have done the same thing had he been in his shoes. But the question of whether it's appropriate to blame someone performatively is quite different from whether the action itself deserves blame, right? Whether it is blameworthy. So I think that, you know, the extent to which an action does deserve blame or praise is independent of a standing relation. Um, and if this is the right way to think about moral worth, um, then I don't think the apprise relative approach is, is getting at the right thing. I think it's getting to whether it's appropriate for us to praise or blame, giving our standing. Now, one can push back against this type of uh, problem. I think it, one could like, you know, do the banging the fist on the table response and say, no, actually degrees of moral worth is relativized and the standing relation does a good job at picking out this feature. And this is probably a debate which goes above and beyond the paper that I'm giving here, but still, I think if someone were to make this type of move, especially someone like Markowitz, um, I think they owe us a story as to why degrees of moral worth is relativized, but moral worth simpliciter is not. So recall, you know, that for Markowitz, she still endorses RRT, and RRT does not relativize moral worth simpliciter, right? It just kind of gives us objective conditions to meet moral worth. So a story I think has to be told as to why the why degrees and simpliciter one is relativized and one is not relativized. And in the absence of such a story, I think we have, I think we should be cautious about adopting an apprise of relative approach with an account like the right reason thesis. Okay, so that's my problems with that kind of approach. I'm just going to tell you now how the hybrid view captures degrees of moral worth, an alternative. So I think we should step back and we should think, well, what is degrees of moral worth supposed to capture here? Right? And a solution to this can be found by going back to the core constraint on moral worth that we started with, the non-accidentality constraint. So recall that moral worth simpliciter depends upon whether an action was brought about through luck, right? If it's accidentally right, then it's not a candidate for moral worth. Well, it's reasonable to suppose then that the degree of moral worth depends upon the degree to which the action was brought about through luck. And one way to capture degrees of luck is by considering how the agent would have acted in various counterfactual scenarios. If the agent would do well in a broad range of counterfactuals, well, then she didn't require certain circumstances to bridge this gap between motivation and moral rightness, right? Her action doesn't depend upon her environment, her action depends upon her praiseworthy motive. Such an agent does not depend on, on luck to do well. Whereas, you know, if an agent has a, a pretty fragile, shaky motive, well then it, it kind of shows that um, she's not gonna do well in lots of counterfactual scenarios because she needed certain circumstances to be in place for her to actually do well. Certain circumstances were needed to, to bridge this gap. Now, a useful way of looking at this, I think, will be then to look at an agent's motivational strength. So if one has a very robust motive, then one's gonna do well in lots of alternative scenarios. If one has a very fragile motive, one is not going to do well in lots of counterfactual scenarios. So this is a nice proxy for thinking about degrees. The stronger the motive, the more praise you get. The weaker the motive, um, the less praise you get. And the same for blame. The stronger the blameworthy motive, the more blameworthy you are. Um, 
So the amount of moral worth then is awarded is going to be proportionate to the strength of your motive. And the strength of your motive acts as a proxy for something more substantial, which is um, how much the action is a product of accidentality. How lucky is it? And I think this is a fairly like intuitive way to work out degrees. So, you know, if someone steals your lunch from the departmental fridge um, and they do it in this world and they do it in all of the possible worlds, well, it's not lucky that they stole the lunch, right? It's not unlucky for you. They definitely meant to steal your lunch. If on the other hand, they steal it in the actual world and maybe a couple of others, well, maybe they're not particularly blameworthy because it seems like certain circumstances needed to be in place, right? Perhaps they were particularly hungry Perhaps they had a really bad class beforehand, right? Something like this. And so they should get less blame than the person who would steal it, regardless of the circumstances. Okay, so I'm just gonna take stock here briefly. Uh, at the beginning, I said the hybrid view um, made moral worth into a threshold concept. If you do well in so many worlds to get moral praise or blame simpliciter. And given what I've just said about degrees, it follows that once an agent has met this threshold and has therefore gained moral worth simpliciter, we can move to ask how many additional worlds she would act well in. And the more worlds, the more praise or blame. Okay, so that's degrees. Let's move on to the second desideratum that I called overdetermination. So in this section, what I'm gonna do is tell you that the right reason thesis is committed to a claim about overdetermined actions, which is problematic. And I'll explain why it's problematic. And then I'll tell you how the hybrid view is committed to a different claim about overdetermined actions, which is not problematic um, and therefore better satisfies the desideratum. So I use the term overdetermined actions to refer to cases in which one has two or more independent motives for acting and each motive is sufficient enough to bring about the action by itself, right? Had, had one motive not been there, the agent would have acted anyway. And the category of overdetermined actions, which poses a problem for theories of moral worth, are those in which one of the motives is a praiseworthy one and one of the motives is a non-praiseworthy one. So for us, it's gonna be a problem when the agent acts in response to the right sorts of reasons and also has a, a, a bad motive for acting, maybe a motive of self-interest or something like that. And then the question is, when we have this motivational structure, are we still morally praiseworthy? So to illustrate here, take, um, take an example. So a politician volunteers at a food bank from two motives. The first one, it's in her career interest to be seen volunteering. And the second one, um, volunteering relieves the suffering of those less fortunate. Um, and I feel like being overdetermined in this way is pretty common. I mean, Jess Phillips here is a Labour politician, and I feel like she has conviction, and I feel like it's true. She does have the second motive. She really does want to relieve the suffering of those less fortunate. But given how stylized this photo is, it also strikes me that she is volunteering in the food bank because, you know, it, it will boost her career prospects somewhat. Now, if we suppose that M2, if the second motive is doing something right in response to the right reasons. Are we to say that on this occasion, Jess responds to the right sorts of reasons and thus is morally praiseworthy? So I think the right reason thesis is going to say yes. And this is because according to the view, to get moral worth, all you have to do is do the right thing for the right sorts of reasons, right? Nothing in the account precludes us from having more motives for doing what we do. So as it stands, a right reason thesis is committed to something like this claim, or which says all motivationally overdetermined actions have moral worth, if and only if at least one of the motives was a response to the right source of reasons. Um, it should be pointed out that I actually, as far as I'm aware, prominent defenders of the right reason thesis have fallen silent on this question, uh, with the exception of Julia Markovitz, who does bring up overdetermined actions just to tell us that she's not gonna talk about overdetermined actions. Um, although in a footnote, she does say this. So she says, if there are cases of motivational overdetermination, it may be okay to have some non-moral motives for doing the right thing, so long as we're also fully motivated by the actual normative reasons justifying the act. Um, so this brief remarks gives us little guidance on the question here. 
um, other than to say like it may be okay to have to be overdetermined sometimes um, like the theory is amiable to that idea but I, I also don't know what being fully motivated means what that entails so in the absence of a, like a full-blown discussion about this I think it's fair to characterize the account as committing themselves to this claim all and it also does seem to be in the spirit of what Markowitz is saying in this footnote however it's been pointed out by Barbara Herman that endorsing a claim like all is problematic. And it's problematic, says Herman, because we would end up praising actions which are only accidentally right. And thus we would be violating the non-accidentality constraint. So she thinks an account which commits us to a claim like this ought to be um, revised or rejected. So here's a quote from Herman. Uh, it's a bit, sorry, it's a bit long, but just explaining why overdetermined actions might be only accidentally right. So she says, as circumstances change, we may expect the two, we may expect the actions the two motives require to be different and at times incompatible. Then an agent might not have a moral motive capable of producing a required action by itself if his presently cooperating motive, uh, non-moral motives, were instead in conflict with the moral motive. That is, an agent could, in different circumstances, act contrary to duty from the same configuration of moral and non-moral motives that in the fallacious circumstances led him to act rightly. So here, Herman is arguing that when circumstances change, we may expect the two motives that were hitherto compatible to become antagonistic and start pulling the agent towards different ends. And during such conflict, the agent may, might feel the pull of like the non-praiseworthy motive more than the praiseworthy one, leading them to act contrary to duty. And attending to this possibility that the agent would not act well in altered circumstances introduces the suspicion that the original configuration of motives produced right actions only accidentally. So if in the counterfactual situation, one does feel the pull of the non-praiseworthy motive more than the praiseworthy one, and this would not act well. It looks as though when they do actually act well, it's kind of accidental, right? It happened to be the case that circumstances made the two motives cooperate in the way they do. I'm just gonna kind of clarify this a bit more with Jess again, because I feel like it could be uh, tricky to get. So Jess volunteers at the food bank from two motives, motive one and motive two. Um, and these motives are pushing her in the same direction. Is she praiseworthy for acting? Well, possibly not, says Herman, right? Because the fact that she volunteers in this world from these two motives is compatible with the thought that if these two motives were no longer pushing her in the same direction, she would fail to volunteer. And I, we can easily imagine such scenarios where the motives are combative rather than cooperative. So, you know, suppose on the day, the photographer cancels last minute or the press don't show up, right? And then it's no longer in her career interest to go to the food bank. Well, if Jess doesn't volunteer in this world, then it reveals that her doing well in the actual world depended upon the two motives cooperating in the way they did. And the reason they cooperate in the way they did is because of contingent circumstances being in place, right? So when Jess volunteers, it's, it's not because she has a lovely, robust, praiseworthy motive, Rather, it's because certain circumstances obtained at the time, and this we see her as acting somewhat accidentally. So in light of this, I think we have reasons to object, uh, reject all. That's kind of the upshot of Herman's um, argument. So, you know, although all does meet the desideratum in that it gives us an answer to it, it says, yes, they are praiseworthy. It does so at the risk of violating a far more fundamental desideratum, the non-accidentality constraint. So I think we should search for a better alternative. Now, once we reject all, we might be tempted to go for a second option, which is none. And this says no over uh, motivationally overdetermined actions can have moral worth. And Kant is sometimes um, viewed as an advocate of this view, though possibly uncharitably. So he seemingly claims that a dutiful act can have moral worth only if it's done from the motive of duty alone, right? i.e. is not overdetermined. And so the view has been heavily criticized for 
seeing a resentfully performed action as morally preferable to an action done with enjoyment, say. So, you know, I help you move house um, and I do so because I promised and also because I enjoy helping you. Well, according to this Kantian view, since my act is not done solely from the motive of duty, but also from enjoyment, I don't get any moral credit. Now, this seems far too restrictive, right? That's the problem with this one. It's just not intuitive. I should get moral worth. If, if I just enjoy helping you move house as well and because I promised. So we should take our lesson from Kant and we shouldn't place an indiscriminatory ban on actions just because they are overdetermined, right? So we've got rid of all and we've got rid of none. And I think this leaves us with some, right? Some motivationally overdetermined actions um, have moral worth. And in particular, it's gonna be the actions which do not violate the non-accidentality constraint. So in what remains, I'm just very briefly gonna tell you how the hybrid view can capture some. So let's go back a little bit and refresh. So my view says uh, moral worth, you get moral worth if you do something good in response to the right sorts of reasons in the actual world and in a range of nearby possible worlds. And then to look at degrees, we consider how many additional worlds you would act well in. Well, how does the hybrid view satisfy some? Well, really simply in virtue of its first condition, right? In virtue of this condition for moral worth simpliciter, it says, no, not all motivationally overdetermined actions are praiseworthy. The ones which are praiseworthy are going to be the one that, ones that meet this threshold. Um, and by meeting the threshold, we can be sure that the action does not violate the non-accidentality constraint. Well, why doesn't it violate the constraint? Well, luck can't persist across the modal universe in this way, right? If an agent continues to act rightly in a range of alternative circumstances, then we know that their acting rightly was not a product of accidental circumstances which fostered cooperation between the non-praiseworthy and praiseworthy motive. Now, if on the other hand, the praiseworthy motive is precarious enough such that it's going to lose out to the non-praiseworthy motive, so sorry, the if the praiseworthy motive is precarious enough such that it will lose out and the agent will not act rightly, well then it seems to be that the agent's actually doing well was the result of this accidental cooperation between praiseworthy and non-praiseworthy motive. And given that it's accidental, they, they shouldn't get any moral credit. Now, I think this is a fairly nice way to think about overdetermination, given that it's built into the hybrid view already. Um, we can solve it without adding additional conditions or anything like that. The resolution is there, ready to go. Um, okay, so let me uh, conclude then. So at the start, I said, right reason thesis is great, but it doesn't adequately satisfy two important desideratums associated with theories of moral worth. I said, but it, it could satisfy these requirements if it's supplemented with a counterfactual framework. And then I moved on to look at the uh, requirements, started with degrees. And I said, Markowitz's extension doesn't quite capture the whole spectrum of praise and blameworthiness. And also I wasn't sure if it actually captures praise and blameworthiness. And then I said, the hybrid view not only captures praise and blameworthiness and the whole spectrum of degrees and praise and blame, uh, does so in quite an intuitive way, just by tracking the strength of one's blameworthy or praiseworthy motive. Then I looked at overdetermination and I said, RRT is committed to a problematic claim about overdetermined actions that violate the non-accidentality constraint, and the hybrid view is committed to a different claim which does not violate the constraint and thus gives a better, better solution to the desideratum. Okay, that's me. Thanks everyone for listening.